Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to another Venom vlog. And today we're going to talk about two issues again. And the last one I thought just talking about two issues would be short. And I proved myself wrong because I am a chatty Cathy. So this one might run a little longer than I thought it was going to also. But there also isn't a ton of anti-Venom Eddie Brock stuff in here. And I wouldn't say there's a real arc for Eddie either in the storyline. It just feels like Bendis just kind of shoehorned him in just to have him in there. Uh, but he does have a point of view, I guess, at one point in the story. So I thought it was worth mentioning. But I had no idea these two issues existed. I had no idea that these were appearances that Anti-Venom made. So this was completely off my radar. All these years, I thought I read everything with Anti-Venom in it. Because he wasn't around for long. He was just, you know, New Ways to Die, Black and White, um, you know, New Ways to Live, Return of Anti-Venom and then Spider Island. And that was pretty much all of Eddie Brock's time as uh, Anti-Venom. So he didn't last very long, maybe about a year, year and a half, something like that. So uh, so it was a short-lived life. And uh, unfortunately for Anti-Venom you know, history, it's, it was a short-lived Anti-Venom life for Flash Thompson later on too, which we'll get there eventually, you know, and especially this season on the show, because uh, we got to talk about what happens to Flash at the end uh, after he becomes Agent Anti-Venom. Uh, but we'll get to that point. Uh, for this one though, there were two Avengers annuals that came out in 2011, I think, or somewhere around there, maybe 2010, I can't remember, but completely off my radar, didn't know they existed. Uh, Bendis was the writer of two Avengers books at the time, New Avengers and just a book called Avengers, and this was after Dark Avengers storyline, so after they had kind of uh, got rid of Norman Osborn and they took down them in the Siege storyline, they kind of relaunched the Avengers books and they had two Avengers teams again, uh, one with a lot of more traditional characters in it, like Captain America, Thor, and Iron Man. And then there was some the, another team called the New Avengers that was more of the, the newer version, like the Bendis type version. So it had like Luke Cage on there, uh, Beast from the X-Men I think was on the team, or I think he's on the main team. Uh, this team had like the Thing in it from Fantastic Four. Uh, Spider-Man, Wolverine, uh, characters like that. So, uh, so yeah, and I think Moon Knight was on one of the teams, like the Secret Avengers or something. So they had a bunch of different teams, uh, for sure. A lot of the different Avengers. So these two annuals were written by Brian Michael Bendis and art by Gabriel Del Otto, who's a phenomenal artist. Um, and I really like his uh, his layouts and panels in this one, too. Uh, doing covers and doing interiors are two different things. He really paints and goes crazy with his covers. On the interiors, though, I think he just does the pencil work and maybe some of the line work and maybe inks. I don't know. But, uh, but they might bring in other inkers and colorists. So it doesn't match like his covers. I've seen people go, oh man, I love him on covers, but I don't like him on interiors. I like him on both. I, I think his style is still great, whether he's drawing covers or interiors, but covers he paints himself and he goes all out with those. In interiors, you got to get the book out on time, right? So he just does the pencil work and other people come in and help out. So uh, so yeah, but I still think it looks great. Uh, so what happens in this issue and to give you a little background, uh, you know, obviously the, the Avengers have been through a lot, right? And uh, and so they've already gone through House of M, where Scarlet Witch had kind of lost her mind and uh, gotten rid of all the mutants. And then in the aftermath of that, she brought back some people that she wanted to see get resurrected, like someone she used to be in love with, uh, who was Wonder Man, a.k.a. Simon Williams. And she brings him back from the dead. And so he's a big factor in this storyline. And when he came back, he's kind of questioning... What he's even doing he's like i died i went to the next life and now i got sucked back here and i have no idea if i'm real or not i don't know what is going on i could just be an imagination thing that scarlet witch came up with uh he goes because she misses me and he goes but i, I don't know what i am and he goes so i'm telling the avengers like i told them shut it down he went to miss marvel or captain marvel you know uh, carol danvers he went to her iron man captain america and he's like shut this down stop being avengers you guys cause more problems than you than you you know help at this point. You're su you're such big targets now that even villains were able to impersonate you guys and take over the freaking world for a while. You know he goes so knock it off like you're you're just making everything worse. And of course the Avengers don't listen because they believe in their hearts that they're doing more good than bad. So Simon is like you know what I can't deal with that anymore. I can't deal with seeing them on TV and seeing lives get destroyed and and people dying. Uh you know in the in the cataclysm of their battles. So I gotta, I'm going to do something about it. I promised them I would. I gave them a chance. It's been, you know, a month or whatever. And now I'm going to go uh, get them. So before he does, he goes and recruits a team. And he calls them the Revengers. I think they call themselves that. I don't think he officially names them. But I think they go by the Revengers. And it's Wonder Man. And then he recruits Eddie Brock, who is anti-venom at this point, obviously. A guy named Devil Slayer. Uh, D-Man, who is my friend uh, Gene, one of his favorite characters, because he's so lame. But Gene loves lame characters. Those are some of his favorite characters. And I love that D-Man throughout this whole book is like, don't you guys remember me? I'm D-Man. And they're like, who the hell is D Like Wolverine's like, who? And he's Spider-Man's like, I don't remember who you are. He's like, I'm D-Man, dude. Demolition Man. That, that's me. And uh, they're like, 
nope, doesn't ring a bell. And he's like, we've met like 20 times. And Spider-Man's like, I have no idea who you are, dude. <laughs> so, uh, so I love that they had some fun with that. That was pretty good. Um, then there's Atlas and Goliath. So two growing characters, characters that can grow tall. Um, Captain Ultra, Century, and a guy named Ethan Edwards who goes by the villain name uh, Virtue. Or I guess they all kind of consider themselves more anti-heroes at this point. Uh, so that's what Wonder Man has kind of formed together is a bunch of uh, uh, characters who kind of consider themselves D-list anti-heroes, essentially. Um, although Anti-Venom's a little above D-list, obviously, uh, but still, you know, it's, it was cool to see him brought in on this team, and I was really hoping Bendis would do something with him, and he kind of doesn't, uh, but that's kind of Bendis, like, and the writing in this is, is pretty bad, I mean, Bendis is, when, I don't know, he, he can write good, you know, write really well, I know he can, I've seen it, I've seen some of the indie stuff, I've seen some of his Daredevil stuff, he can write really interesting dialogue, but after a while, he got kind of famous for writing the style of dialogue where it was just like, two people talking, you know, and it was just like, and really nothing of substance is being said. It's like, hey, you, who, me? Yeah, you, me or him? No, you, yeah, you, oh, me, okay, what? You know, and it's like, that takes up like half a page. He got kind of known for doing stuff like that with Ultimate Spider-Man and people kind of like that. And I think a lot of people like that because it fit for a young 15 year old Spider-Man to have, you know, kind of quick dialogue like that, uh, especially for younger readers. But when he went on to do Avengers and X-Men and other things, that dialogue didn't work. You can't have Tony Stark talk like that. You can't have Wolverine talk like that. And he did. He just, he just, that was his style. He just started getting into that style. And it was, uh, it's lazy in my opinion. So when I was reading this, I was like, man, this could have been a, a really great story. It's not a bad story, um, but it's not a, it could have been really cool. Like Simon Williams is like, look, he gathers this team and he says, the, the Avengers are responsible for some horrible stuff. He goes, number one, Ultron. The Avengers helped create him. He's evil that's bad. You know, he goes, uh, number two, Scarlet Witch, they let her run rampant. And, uh, then she, you know, wiped out all the mutants in the world. And then when she came back, she started bringing people back who were dead, like myself. He goes, she's r running around unchecked and they need to deal with her basically. And he goes, uh, but they won't because you know, they're all friends. Um, he goes, uh, then also, uh, we have had the Hulk, you know, who's a member of the team and he's done a lot of damage throughout his, you know, life as the Hulk. Uh, then also there was Civil War uh, and then the Dark Avengers. And he's like, these are big moments that uh, that people's lives were ruined or lost. And it's because of them. He's like, Goliath, you know, the new Goliath on this team. He's like, you were, uh, there was a guy who wore that mantle before you, you know, uh, Bill Foster, who uh, got killed by a clone Thor that Iron Man made for his Avengers team. Um, and a crime he still has not paid for yet. He goes, these people are out of control. And I really like that. I was like, you know what? He's right. He and, he and Simon is like, so I'm not here to, to make a team to like replace the Avengers. He goes, no, a team is bad. Like what they're doing is bad. Anyone replacing them will be just as bad. So what we're going to do is we're going to go take them down. And then that's it. We're just going to beat the crap out of them and embarrass them on live TV. We're going to out them in the public. We're going to say what they're responsible for um, in case people forgot or don't remember or don't know. And he goes, and we're going to just put them on blast. And, and that's what I want to do. So the team is like, great, we're in. So they go and they go to Avengers uh, Mansion first uh, in Central Park and they mess it up. Uh, what's cool is they're all standing outside and they're all like, in, you know, incognito and they're just waiting outside. There's this, you know, mansion and there's just civilians walking around and they wait uh, for um, Jessica, uh, you know, Jessica and Luke Cage who are married, you know, together they have a kid. They're like the nanny's taking the kid for a walk. And they they know they follow the schedule like, all right, every day the nanny walks the kid for like an hour so that the Avengers can talk shop and everything um, and, and gather. So uh, so we're going to wait for that to happen. So they do. And then Virtue, uh, a.k.a. Ethan Edwards, he uses X-ray vision to look through the house. And he's like, OK, here are the Avengers that are in the house. And he lists them all off. And they're like, OK, let's get to work. The baby's clear. They won't be hurt. Let's bring the battle to them. So uh, Goliath runs at the door, uh, or Atlas, I think, actually. Atlas runs right towards the front door, and uh, he, as he's running, he's growing and growing and growing. Then he gets to be the size of the mansion and just shoulder rams right into the mansion and, and causes the whole place to shake. Now, granted, it's built really tough because the Avengers want to be prepared for attacks. So, uh, so there, it's like, you know, lined with certain types of, you know, metals and things that will help it stand up more. 
but uh, it doesn't take too long though. Atlas does tear the place apart, and the uh, you know the Revengers go inside and they start kicking the crap out of the Avengers and uh, the new Avengers. You know, Luke Cage and everybody. So Luke is a he's gotten dismissed uh, because he's like obviously he has unbreakable skin, so he's hard to defeat. So what uh, you know uh, Goliath does is he grab or Atlas I think maybe uh, because they both you know it's two guys growing. So I can't remember which one, uh, but uh, one of them, I think it's Atlas, grabs Luke Cage by the arm and throws him all the way to the Bronx uh, from Central Park. Uh, so that kind of gets rid of Luke Cage. And then Wonder Man takes on Captain Marvel and he beats the living crap out of her. Uh, he's like, he, he, cause he tells, he considers her responsible. He's like, you're in kind of in charge of this team, you and Luke Cage. And he goes, and I told you personally, not Luke, I don't know him that well, but you, I know. And I told you to shut this down and you didn't do it. So I'm taking the fight to you. So Wonder Man does not hold back and he beats the living crap out of Carol Danvers. Um, and then meanwhile, while that's happening, uh, the other team members, Spider-Man, Thing, Wolverine, they're all getting their butts kicked uh, by all these D-listers. Um, and like I said, there is some humor there with D-Man, like, come on, you don't remember me? But uh, even he helps get the upper hand on some people and Anti-Venom gets the upper hand on people. And, you know, it's, it's pretty neat. So you get a big battle scene, basically. And then the book ends with, uh, you know, Maria Hill sending a, a distress call to the Avengers, uh, to Captain America's team with Iron Man and Thor and Moon Knight and everybody else. And she's like, come, come get us. And so the Avengers show up at the end of the issue and they see the rubble and the destruction. And meanwhile, the Avengers are on a rooftop, you know, a few blocks away. And, you know, they go, well, we did it. We won. And, and Eddie's, you know, Eddie Brock, uh, Anti-Venom's like, that's one of the biggest victories I've ever had. He goes, so what do we do now? And he goes, well, we only took down one group of the Avengers. The other one is that tower over there. So they go to Avengers Tower, and that's where the second uh, issue takes place. So the first issue was the new Avengers Annual Number One, and this one is just called Avengers Annual Number One. And uh, and so they go to Avengers Tower, and they start beating beating it and tearing it apart. You know, the two guys who grow, Atlas and uh, Goliath, they're like tearing it apart on either side. And then I guess they plant some bombs in it. And then when the, by the time the Avengers get there, because they see the explosions and attacks, they're like, oh, those mother effers, you know, and so they all get in the Quinjet, they pick up the new Avengers, and all of them now, a whole team of like 20 Avengers, now head up to the tower, and when they get there, the Revengers aren't there, and they're like, where are they? And there's a TV on, and it shows a press conference, and it's like down, you know, in, in New York, and down in the, in downtown New York or something, so, uh, so they turn around, they're like, all right, we got to go stop them, so they go down to like outside City Hall or something like that, where they're, you know, having this big conversation, and uh, there's all this press and crew members around, and Wonder Man is saying, like, here are the sins of the Avengers, here's what they've done, and uh, this is why you shouldn't trust them, and, you know, they allowed Norman Osborn to take, you know, take over, because they were too afraid to do anything, and, and really sacrifice something to save you guys, they led, they couldn't settle their differences, and led to civil war, they co-created Ultron, they protect the Hulk, you know, so he starts going off on his tangent about, like, what their sins are, and while he's doing that, you know, the press is kind of eating it up, they're like, well, this is kind of true, so the Avengers show up and say, hey, shut this down, uh, you know, we're, we're not, we don't want to fight you guys. And, uh, and Iron Man shows up and he's got this little orb in his hand. He's like, Simon, you know, Wonder Man. He's like, please tell your you know team to stand down and we won't hurt you. And he goes, uh, he goes, hurt me. He's like, are you kidding me? You guys are evil. And he goes, uh, he goes, look, we've made mistakes. Absolutely. And do we have to answer for some of them still? Maybe I, I get it. He goes, but uh, we we still here trying to protect people and he goes and if we aren't here uh, something really bad could happen and so we can't take that risk we can't take the risk of having essentially a day off and not being the avengers and so simon doesn't want to hear that so he's ready to fight iron man but iron man uses that orb and completely drains simon of all of his ener energy powers and he's like simon you warned us like a month ago that you were coming to attack and so I've been preparing for this attack. And he goes, and so you started with the other Avengers team. Who, and when you caught them off guard, they weren't ready for it. But now you're dealing with us. And he goes, and I've been waiting for you. And he goes, and uh, your buddy, uh, the Beast, you know, Hank, he's he helped me make this. And he goes, so we, we knew how to defeat you really easily. So they do, and they take him down. And then Thor... And the other is, you know, he flies over uh, the other team members, the Revengers, like Eddie Brock and everybody, Atlas and everyone. He's like, he's like, all right, so what's it going to be? You're going to give up uh, because we just took down your boss. And they're like, no, well, like we believe what he said. You guys are monsters and we're coming after you. So uh, so then someone I, you think casts a spell like Doctor Strange or somebody or Wong or someone and it teleports all of them into like a city stadium <laughs> and they're just like in the middle of an empty stadium. There's no no sports. Nothing's going on. So they're in the middle of a football field with the Avengers and Thor's like, great. So now there's no innocent bystanders. 
we're ready to kick the crap out of you. And so they get their rematch. So Thor lets Spider-Man thing and all the new Avengers kind of get their rematch and, uh, and they beat the Avengers. Um, so they do, and they capture everybody and they arrest them at the end. Uh, but they, I think they let most of them go Eddie Brock. They kind of, uh, question each one of them. And each one is giving like some kind of crazy answer of like, you know, like they're kind of irrational, you know, virtue has, he's kind of a little off his rocker demands a little weird, obviously. And they get to Eddie Brock and Eddie Brock, uh, they're like, well, you know, why'd you do it? And he goes, you know, I'm not, I'm not like the others. I'm not some crazy person, you know, just, uh, you know, looking to punch heroes. He goes, um, but I genuinely believe Wonder Man was right. I, I think you guys are a menace in a way. And I don't think you should exist. He goes, I think Simon was right about all the harm you've caused. So that's the one thing I liked is that Bendis at least gave Eddie Brock a moment in this book. Not a great moment and not a moment that was any bigger than he gave any other characters. But at least he gave him a moment to have a point of view. Because really in this storyline, Eddie's not in it that much. Like he's just, you see him fighting a couple times and he gets like one or two one-liners. Uh, but that's it. So, uh, so there's not a lot of things to sink our teeth into when it comes to Eddie Brock in this episode. Uh, but he is in the book, and that's why I wanted to at least cover it. And since he had a POV, and he had at least a statement to make and had a point of view on something, I was like, well, then I should make an episode on it. Because otherwise, I would have skipped this storyline. And apparently, I mean, like, I skipped it when it came out. I had no idea this book existed. So when I reread it, I was like, or when I was, or reread it, when I read it the first time a couple months ago, I was excited because I was like, wow, an anti-venom story that I haven't read yet. This is going to be great. And then I read it, and I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. Uh, but Eddie does give his two cents at the end, and I think that essentially lets him go. Like they're like, all right, whatever. We're not gonna, we're not gonna hold you here. You didn't kill anybody. You didn't hurt anybody. Uh, you did fight the Avengers, and that was that was with bull crap. I guess they let Eddie go home, you know, and he's he's free to go about himself, which makes sense because he's gonna just pop up in the Spider Island storyline. And so we'll get to that point, you know, when we get there. Uh, but he plays a big part in Spider Island. So so that'll be our next big Eddie Brock anti-venom story we talk about will be when I get to Florida and we'll do a big Spider Island episode. But before we get there, the next story I want to talk about is Crossroads, which is from Amazing Spider-Man 665, which deals with Flash Thompson. Um, but then also, and it has, it's just like a quick little Flash Thompson story with Peter Parker and Betty Brant. Uh, but then there's also uh, Venom number five, where, you know, Agent Venom flashes Agent Venom issue five. We didn't talk about that in our first episode. I, I meant to, and then I did the episode and I recorded it and I realized, oh wow, I didn't talk about the storyline where Flash Thompson wasn't in, I mentioned it, that he didn't wear the suit in the whole issue, but I didn't talk about it in full detail because that's a really great single issue. It's like Flash going and looking for his abusive father and uh, and confronting him after all these years of, you know, because uh, uh, obviously Flash was abused as a child and it's like him getting some closure with his dad. And that's a good issue. And I was like, I can't believe I missed that one. So Crossroads and that issue we're going to talk about in the next episode. And that'll be my final episode I record for Venom Vlog before I leave for Florida. So thank you guys again for the support. Let me know if you've read these two annuals, what you think of them. Um, if you think I missed anything, obviously let me know down below. And if you haven't read them, check them out. I mean, like I said, it's not essential reading for Eddie Brock stuff because he's not really in it that much, but it was kind of great seeing him at the end kind of give a perspective. And so you can at least see where he's kind of coming from. And I think Bendis did a good job with that where he's, you know, he's like, all right, let's give Eddie a reason to be a part of this that doesn't line up with all the other guys who just wanted to beat up on superheroes. Eddie's not like that. And I appreciate Bendis acknowledging that on some level. So I, even though I'm very critical of the guy, I give him a little bit of credit here for at least giving Eddie that one moment at the end where you're kind of like, all right, all right, Eddie's, he still feels like Eddie to an extent, uh, even though this is his only real moment in the book he speaks for the most part, um, it was a good moment. So yeah, that's my two cents on it. But if you have a different opinion, obviously let me know down below. And as always, we'll continue our conversation down there. One more episode to go before Florida. So thank you guys again. And if I can, I'll try to squeeze in a live stream this weekend so I can talk to you guys all live one last time before I hit the road. So be on the lookout for that around Saturday or Sunday, probably. So uh, again, thank you so much. See you all in the future. Peace.